Hello and welcome. My name is Suzanne Wagstaff and I am the director of the Alumni Networks and Regional Programs. I work for the Washington University Alumni Association. I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation, Privacy in the 21st Century, How to Protect Your Personal Information in the Digital Age. Now, before we begin, I wanna explain the format for today's session. You will only hear and see me, Rebecca, and her presentation. Today's program will last about 60 minutes, and we encourage you to participate and interact by introducing yourself in the chat box. Tell us where you're joining us from and your affiliation to the university. Also, make sure to hit all attendees and panelists on the pull down so that everyone can see who's joining us today. We also encourage you to ask questions at any time. And to do that, please type a question in the Q&A or the chat box at any time during the talk. Following the presentation, we will have time for your questions. This webinar is being recorded and we will share it on the Alumni Association YouTube channel following the event. We will also send it out in the survey, which will come out following this event that will have a link to the recording. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Rebecca Satin. Rebecca is the Chief Information Officer of World Software Corporation. She was formerly at Mitchell Silber Silberberg and NUP LLP for 18 years, where she was the Director of Information Technology. She has more than 30 years of experience in the area of law firm technology. In the last several years, she has spoken to law firms and bar associations about cybersecurity. She's also spoken on various other topics such as design thinking, collaboration and deployment planning at the International Legal Technology Association conferences, legal tech shows and other technology forums. She has also served on the advisory boards for LA's City Colleges, City Colleges Computer Technology Department and Ithaca College Executive Education Cybersecurity Program. Rebecca is an alumna of Washington University, having received her Bachelor of Arts in 1989 from the School of Arts and Sciences. Rebecca is also a volunteer for the WashU Northern New, Jer New Jersey Network and has helped to plan and run several events in that area. I am thrilled to be doing this presentation tonight or bringing Rebecca to you. Her and I have discussed doing this event for several years and we are thrilled that we are finally making that a reality. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Satin. Thanks, Suzanne. And uh, thanks to everybody for, for signing into this. So as Suzanne said, uh, my name is Rebecca Satin. I spent my entire career working in information technology, mostly as a law firm IT director. But for the past five and a half years, I've been chief information officer for World Software Company, a company that makes document management systems that are primarily used by law firms, legal departments, and other professional services firms. So just a small disclaimer before I get started, this picture that you see was taken before the pandemic. So today I'll be speaking about best practices for keeping your personal information safe at home, and also when you're working with lawyers, accountants, and healthcare professionals. The smaller the firm, sometimes the harder it is for them to keep up to date on their obligations to keep your information secure. But even large firms have this issue. Part of what I want to do today is educate you on what obligations these professionals have in keeping your data safe so that you can demand more of them. And I must admit that this makes me kind of a nightmare client for my lawyer and my accountant and healthcare providers, but I usually warn them up front about what I do for a living. Nevertheless, I've still caught some of them using unsafe practices, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Some of the content at the beginning of this presentation might seem a little bit dry, but as I mentioned, I want all of you to understand the obligations that your service providers have to keep your information safe and secure, so bear with me through that part. These days, it's convenient to keep track of your information digitally, and consumer products make it really easy. But there are compromises you make in order to have that convenience. 
So security often comes at the expense of convenience, but there has to be a balance. If it's too difficult to do something that might be more secure, people might not do it. That's the job of software companies and IT people to make things both secure and easy to use. Software and hardware products in and of themselves often can be set up in a secure fashion, but they're not necessarily set that way by default. A good example that I'll come back to later is the internet equipment that you get from your service provider at home. Additionally, systems are only as secure as their weakest link. So setting up a system securely, but then making an exception for one person, say the, CI, the CEO or the president, leaves that person as the weakest link and leaves the whole system vulnerable. This holds true of IT personnel too. If the account they use to log into a system and check email has permissions to do anything on the system, then one click on the wrong thing could leave the entire system compromised. In the last 50 years, there have been many regulations enacted pertaining to an alphabet soup of sensitive information. I'm not gonna go over all of these, but I wanna go over a few that are particularly important. Two more recent regulations to come out are GDPR, the General Data Protection Rule, and CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. They both pertain to data privacy. GDPR contains guidelines for the collection and processing of personal, personal information for individuals within the European Union, but it also covers the rights of that individual to control that information and the methods that must be imposed on storing and processing that data. This includes the right to be forgotten. Once a company no longer requires your information, you have the right to request that it be deleted from their systems. CCPA is very similar to GDPR in that it pertains to privacy, but it actually has a broader scope of what data is protected and includes any information that can identify a household rather than just an individual. So here's the thing, whenever you provide your personal information to a company, that's one more chance that it can be compromised. So the first one that I wanna talk about is Graham-Leach-Bliley. Uh, this act became law in 1999. It requires financial institutions to secure non-public personal information or NPI and to annually let customers know how this information is used. You might notice that your banks and credit card companies send you information annually about this. So make sure that you read these disclosures. They actually have to provide you with the ability to opt out of having your information shared. But unfortunately, this, put, this puts the responsibility on you to take action. If you don't send back the opt out notice, they're gonna share your information. Sarbanes-Oxley or SOX regulation was written in response to Enron, WorldCom, and Tyco. In those situations, those companies' submissions to the SEC did not reflect what was really going on within the company. It also made the board of directors of publicly held companies directly responsible for management of risk, along with outside auditors. While SOX was written more to provide oversight into all kinds of risks, the risks involved in storing sensitive information uh, that's one of them. So because of SOX, the board of directors of public companies are now directly responsible for managing those risks and maintaining the security of our data. Now, HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, uh, this basically makes all of your healthcare providers, including pharmacies insurance, and insurance companies, they're required to comply with this. Um, this this law actually involves yet another acronym, PHI or protected health information. Not only are these healthcare providers and insurers responsible for protecting your health information, but so are what's called their business associates. This includes their lawyers and any other third party provider who might come into contact with your protected health information. You might have noticed that doctors and dentists have included social security numbers on their intake forms. My suspicion is that this might be a holdover from when insurance companies used social security numbers as ID numbers. In fact, I think I remember, I don't know, I might be wrong. It was either college or someplace else where like an ID 
used my social security number. Maybe it was a driver's license number in one state, uh, but they don't do that anymore, thankfully. Anyway, uh, doctors do not need your social security number for anything. So just because they have that on their intake form doesn't mean that you have to share it. Just leave that field blank in the form. Um, so I routinely leave that space blank when completing those forms. And for that matter, if there's anybody that requests that information of me, I routinely ask why they need my social security number. And if they can't give me a reasonable explanation, I don't include it. Only the IRS really needs that or your accountant for your tax forms. So I have several examples of situations in my life where I identified risks to my personal information. At my dentist's office several years ago, um, they were taking x-rays and it was a new enough office that the x-rays, they would take the x-ray and then they would appear up on a monitor to, to the right of me so that everybody could see the x-ray. Well, I looked over at the monitor and I noticed that they were using Windows XP. And at the time, Windows XP had already reached end of life a year or two before that which means that Microsoft is no longer providing security updates for it. So basically it left, it left any Windows XP system vulnerable to any sort of uh, attack because they weren't putting security updates out for it anymore. So I talked to the people at the dentist's office and the people that I talked to didn't seem particularly concerned, but the next time I went to the dentist's office, I didn't see Windows XP anymore. Another in instance that makes me uncomfortable is when at the pharmacy, they ask for your date of birth when they're looking for your prescription. Now, I completely get that, you know, especially if, you know, my, my husband's name is Bob Price. So a very common name. There might be, you know, 20 Bob Prices that are all getting their prescriptions filled at the same pharmacy. So I get that they need that information to make sure that they have the right person but I just don't like having to tell it to them to where the other people that are standing nearby might be able to hear it. So uh, I usually will just either write it down or I'll show them you know, my driver's license that has that information on it or something so that that way I don't have to say it out loud where anybody can hear it. Now, law firms don't have to comply with many of these regulations because they're private companies. But if their clients, if the clients that they represent demand that they comply, then that's when a lot of law firms start to put in more security. But even if their clients aren't demanding it at this point, they still have to comply with the ABA model rules and also any state or local bar rules. So back in 2012, there were some comments that were added to rules 1.1 pertaining to competence and 1.6 pertaining to confidentiality of information. The comment that was added to rule 1.1 stated that lawyers need to understand the benefits and the risks associated with the technology that they use in their practice. Um, this sounds pretty minor, but essentially it means they can't just think, oh yeah, Dropbox, that's really cool. I'm gonna use that. They have to actually understand what risks might be involved in using Dropbox before they use it. In rule 1.6, the comment that was added indicated that lawyers must make reasonable efforts to prevent access or disclosure of confidential information. The legal technology community was actually quite disappointed at the time that this was so vague. But I mean, I agreed that it was vague, but I kind of thought that part of the reason that they did that was so that it would address firms of any size. If they were too specific, then the large firms then, that, then they might say something that only addressed large firms or only addressed small firms. But uh, anyway, they ended up changing their guidance a little bit later. In May of 2017, they provided updated guidance regarding the confidentiality of client electronic communication in formal opinion 477R. It states that it's not always reasonable to rely on the use of unencrypted email. So ultimately, if you're communicating with your lawyer using unencrypted email, this does not actually provide you with an expectation of privacy. Any document containing personally identifiable information, like a will or a trust or anything else that might be considered to be confidential, should be encrypted in transit. 
You might also consider that if you use a free email account, it might be crawled for advertising purposes, which I've heard some lawyers uh, comment that that might affect privilege. Rule 1.6 also indicates that there's a responsibility to do an ongoing risk assessment. So as technology changes with each new product that they consider adopting, they have to do an additional risk assessment before adopting a new product or a new process. Uh, so it's taken quite a while. I mean, we've, we've been, this pandemic has been going on since March of 2020, but it took until March of this year for the ABA to update their guidance regarding the virtual practice of law. They re-emphasized rules 1.1, 1.3, and 1.4, which pertain to competence, diligence, and communication, as these functions can be more challenging when practicing virtually. They also re-emphasized the guidance provided in formal opinion 477R with regard to encryption of, communica of communications to clients. They added an important component pertaining to rules 5.1 and 5.3 because the supervision of other lawyers and non-lawyers becomes more difficult with a virtual practice. Practicing virtually doesn't change or diminish this responsibility. The duty to supervise extends to those outside of the law firm. So in 2012, the FBI actually met with some of the largest law firms in the country to warn them that they're actually a target for hackers. They actually characterized them as the soft underbelly, meaning that they were an easy target because classically they didn't have as much security in place as their clients, yet they stored data for many of their clients. Why hack into a big corporation when you can hack into their law firm and get data for many corporations? So in fact, there was, actually, there was actually a movie made that's available on Netflix called The Laundromat with Gary Oldman, Antonio Banderas, and Meryl Streep about the Panama Papers data breach. This, this breach occurred in 2016. It involved the Panama City law firm Mossack Fonseca, who were experts at helping the rich and powerful hide their assets in offshore shell companies. I highly recommend the movie if you're interested. So ransomware, for those who don't know, a ransomware attack is when your data is encrypted by hackers who request a ransom in order to restore access to the data. Depending on the situation, data may or may not have been exfiltrated from the system. In an exfiltration situation, depending on the data stolen, a company may have breach notification requirements and of course, from what we've already learned, public companies and banks have additional regulatory requirements when it comes to the protection and security of their clients' data. I found this Venn diagram on social media a few years ago. Tech savvy people wouldn't have kept Windows XP on any system after it was no longer being supported by Microsoft, but anyone who still had a Windows XP on their computer was probably not tech savvy enough to pay a ransom in Bitcoin Times have actually changed and I find this, I don't know, I was surprised to hear this, but apparently the very hackers who ransom your data now even provide technical support to ensure that they get their payment. Fox Business spoke with Amit Yaran, CEO of cybersecurity firm Tenable, who stated that many of them now have help desks, technical support, payroll processing and subcontractors. They're essentially full-fledged criminal enterprises operating in the digital world. Incidentally, the FBI actually advises companies not to pay ransoms, but even if a company has their data backed up, the amount of time it takes to restore the data to systems is often weeks or months. So if the data has been, also if the data has been exfiltrated, ransoms might be required to keep the hackers from going public with the information. The FBI actually understands this and they've indicated that even though they don't want you to pay, should you, you should still let them know if you do pay. By reporting the breach, you're actually gonna help prevent the next one. Another notable breach that involved, uh, well, another notable breach actually involved the law firm of DLA Piper. Um, they got the Petya ran ransomware in 20, 2017. Coincidentally, I was actually giving a talk on cybersecurity to law firm IT people that day. 
And I had just enough time to add a slide to my presentation about this particular breach. It actually happened in a European office and it was the result of a server not having current security patches installed. So one of the most egregious situations in my opinion was the September 2017 Equifax breach. Um, with, with the breach of a law firm or like Target or Yahoo or something like that, we willingly provided our information to those providers. Even though we all know that our information is collected by credit reporting bureaus, it's not like we specifically said, here's our data. We just signed up with a credit card or um, signed up with a bank or something like that. And they were collecting that information for the purpose of credit reporting. So I just felt this was an even greater intrusion because you sort of have a higher expectation that the likes of Equifax is gonna actually keep your data safe. So more recently, uh, many of the breaches, uh, many of the recent breaches have been of companies that are either part of our critical infrastructure or service our critical infrastructure. For those of you who are unfamiliar with, with SolarWinds, they make products that monitor the health and performance of networks, software that's meant to help detect attacks on systems. This breach began as a phishing attack by hackers that, are, that were linked to Russia's foreign, foreign intelligence service. Despite its, excuse me, despite its simple beginnings, the attack was quite sophisticated and resulted in a tainted update to their Orion software being pushed to customer systems. According to reports from Reuters, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, the update containing malware affected the US Departments of Homeland Security, State, Commerce and Treasury, as well as the National Institutes of Health. Politico reported that nuclear programs run by the US Department of Energy and the National Nuclear Security Administration were also targeted. The colonial pipeline attack involved ransomware. Since they're privately held, they have no requirement to reveal details. When ransomware attacks first started to happen, the ransoms were often smaller but Colonial Pipeline paid $4.4 million in ransom to regain access to their data. For those following the situation, CNN reported that the Justice Department seized about $2.3 million in Bitcoin paid to a hacking group known as DarkSide who were involved in the Colonial Pipeline attack. In February, there was an attack on a Florida water treatment facility in which a hacker tried to change the water supply's levels of sodium hydroxide from 100 parts per million to 11,100 parts per million. It's used to regulate the pH, of, pH level of the water, but, that but at that level, it'll severely damage any human tissue it touches. Luckily, the attack was actually thwarted in real time as it was occurring because somebody noticed a mouse moving on a screen. JBS, one of the world's top meat producers, was actually hit with ransomware just this month, too. Because of the sophistication of many attacks, people always think hackers are initially very sophisticated about how they break into systems. But other than targeted attacks like the solar winds one, the reality is somewhat different. This is why everyone needs to guard closely their personal information all the time and not only when dealing with technology. So who is the real bad guy here? A survey of the International Legal Technology Association showed that legal technologists actually think the greatest threat to the security of their organizations is careless employees. It's not that they're not afraid of hackers or malware or any other bad actors. It's just that all of these bad actor actors primarily get into systems through the carelessness of employees who either haven't had enough training in security awareness or who didn't necessarily take it seriously. Black Hat is a, is a computer security confer conference that provides training and briefings to ethical hackers, corporations, and government agencies. It seems that they actually agree with the assessment of the legal technologists. In their 2017 survey, four out of five blame humans for security breaches. Remembering and changing passwords was noted as the top source of cyber fatigue. Multi-factor authentication and encryption were noted as the biggest hacker obstacles, but we'll come back to that later. 
31% cited access to privileged accounts as the best entry point with access to an email account as a close second at 27%. So fast forwarding to 2020, this Black Hat survey showed an even greater concern with vulnerabilities that arose out of hastily planned remote access processes that were put in place in the early days of the pandemic. The second concern was due to increases in phishing attempts and social engineering attempts that exploited people's fears and interest in COVID. The Wall Street Journal even devoted an entire section to cybersecurity, and on the front page, they featured the challenges of the hybrid workplace. They called it a hacker's dream because of the constantly changing mix of office and remote workers and devices that move in and out of company networks. Social engineering is actually the most widely used and effective tactic, tactic that ha hackers have. They're actually just con artists using psychological manipulation and outright deception to get you to do what they want. Those who use these techniques are really hacking humans, not computers. And they're leveraging your trust to gain access to sensitive information, or in some cases, just to gather intel on others to help them convince others that they're credible. There are many types of social engineering, some of which have nothing to do with technology. Pretexting is where someone lies to obtain private information or impersonates people in certain jobs. They use fabricated scenarios to leverage your emotions against you. An example would be the calls that you get about car warranties. Another example would be a call or an email from someone pretending to be the CEO of your company and asking for some urgent piece of sensitive information. This technique is used in combination with some of the others on this list. Phishing is an attempt to acquire sensitive information, specifically via email, by masquerading as a trustworthy source. Phishing is the number one way that bad actors can gain access to sensitive data and the number one vector for ransomware attacks. A phishing attempt may look like a legitimate email message, but it might include language that sounds like it's urgent that you take some kind of action, like clicking on a link or opening an attachment. Spear phishing targets specific people or organizations by including information about their company or employees within the email. These emails can contain unrealistic promises or threats and usually convey some urgency. Whale phishing is a specific spear phishing attack that targets CEOs in particular. We make spear phishing easier when we don't set our privacy information on social media so that only people we know can see our information. The more people can find out about you online, the more information they can use in spear phishing attacks. This online information can be used in all types of social engineering. Smishing and vishing are similar to phishing, only these messages come to you via text message or SMS, hence the name smishing, or via telephone or voice, hence the name vishing. An example is if you've ever received a text indicating that your account is locked until you click on a link. Another example is when you get a message indicating that you've won something or have a gift card to redeem. These can come via email, text, or voice call. The latter usually comes from an automated system, but sometimes also from a live person calling and asking for your information. Tailgating is another non-technological technique. Someone's tailgating you, uh, someone's tailgating when you use a key card or credentials to get into a door or an elevator and someone actually comes with you right behind you. Piggybacking is similar, but in this case, you knowingly let someone into a physical location or an online account. You should never allow anyone to use your credentials to gain access to anything. Even when employees are approaching a door that requires key card access, it's always best if each individual employee swipes their own card and lets themselves in. Often hackers will also leave USB devices in places like parking lots or on the floor of an office building. They're counting on our curiosity to get the better of us. These devices can be loaded with malware. This is one of the reasons that many companies block the use of USB devices on computers within their organizations. While we're on the subject of USB devices, I have another point to make. Your cell phone uses a USB connection for two purposes. It uses it to charge itself and also to synchronize data. It's the latter that gives me cause for concern. 
when you go to public places that have charging stations, it's possible for data to be extracted from your device if the ports are set up for data as well as for charging. There are charging cables and USB devices available that block the data transmission. So that way you don't need to worry about that. If you only have the cable that came with your device, consider getting another one to use if you frequently need to charge your device in public locations. The last method on this list is dumpster diving. You may laugh at this, but if a company routinely throws away simple enough things like an internal phone list without shredding it first, that list can be used by hackers to craft spear phishing emails that are more convincing because they reference existing company employees. Always shred things that have any personal information on them, whether you're at home or at work. And red flags that you should be watching for are urgency, threatening language, language links, attachments, and offers that sound too good to be true. Anytime somebody requests information about you, you should be on your guard if you didn't initiate the contact. Improve your situational awareness. Don't assume people should be places if they appear unexpectedly. Verify everything and treat requests for sensitive information with skepticism. So this is an example of a phishing attempt that was sent to my boss. Now, I immediately knew that it was false because at the time, the iPhone 7 was not the latest and greatest iPhone available. And I just know that my boss wouldn't be caught dead with an out of date iPhone. But there were other clues. If you actually look at the, the from address, it's from the amazon-sales.com domain rather than the amazon.com domain. Another clue for him is that he doesn't actually have service with AT&T. When you see something like this, if you're concerned that you didn't order a thing, don't click on the links in the message. Just open up a browser and go straight to your Amazon account and look at your recent orders. In fact, never click on the links in emails unless they're emails you expect. Like if your lawyer or a friend of yours says, oh, I'm going to send you a link to this, then fine, click on it. But if you get anything unexpected, whether it's from your bank or from Amazon or anything, it's always better to just go directly to the website. Like if it's from your bank, go to the bank website and then just log in and find whatever it is that you need from there instead of clicking on the link in the email. If you get something from somebody that you know or someplace that doesn't have a website that you can go to, just call them. That's definitely much easier than having to deal with the aftermath of clicking on the wrong thing. So now that I've explained some of the things, some of the risks that we have to our personal information, what can we do about them? Since the Wall Street Journal dedicated an entire section to it, and even the ABA released a formal opinion about working remotely, I thought I'd start by discussing this a little bit further. As people had to quickly pivot to working remotely, they might not have initially set up appropriate work areas. For any professional service situation, like lawyers or accountants, uh, client-related meetings and information should not be overheard or seen by others in the household or any other remote work location either. This was always true, but because of the urgent need to immediately work remotely that started in March of 2020, many may not have had time to plan for it. Anyone not assisting with the representation should never be in a position to overhear conversations to avoid jeopardizing confidentiality. I've traveled quite a bit on business before the pandemic started, and I can't actually tell you how many times that I've either seen people in close proximity, either working on laptops where I could see what was on their screen, or having phone conversations, or even conversations with colleagues nearby when I was close enough to hear the details. I've even heard people providing their credit card information over the phone in airports when I was close enough to overhear. Perhaps I just look trustworthy and people are not worried about these things when I'm around, but keep in mind that bad actors are able to do their thing by blending in and by looking trustworthy. Another important point about remote work relates to the use of smart speakers like Amazon Alexa or Echo or Google Home and other such devices. Unless the technology is assisting in someone's business practice, the listening capability of the devices really should be disabled while communicating about business. I'd like to also talk a bit about your home internet service. 
When you set up internet service from home, your internet service provider provides at least some of the equipment to your home. Whether you or your ISP provides your wireless internet equipment, ensure that you change the SSID or service set identifier. This is the name of the wireless network that it creates. Always change the name from the default and also change the default passwords. The name should be something that does not identify you or your family. I'm sure that when you connect to, to your home Wi-Fi, you probably notice the SSIDs of your neighbors. You don't want them to be able to identify you from yours or learn anything about you from yours. Some systems will allow you to hide the SSID, but then you need to ensure that the devices that you're connecting allow you to connect using the advanced options when you enter all the pertinent information manually. Also make sure that the firmware on the device is always updated to the latest version. And if there are any remote access features on the device, make sure you disable them. If you have any Internet of Things or IoT devices, they should be set up on a separate network, perhaps your guest network. Most of those uh, devices that you get have the ability to set up a guest network that's separate from the network that you connect to for your primary use. So these IoT devices usually have weak or non-existent password requirements, and they're often not patched frequently. As a result, they increase your risk. If there's an ability to change the default passwords, always change them from the default. Apply updates as soon as they're available. Since some of them require that you set up an account, make sure that it's not an account that you use for anything personal. Yes, I know that that sometimes de defeats the purpose of having these devices, but you need to decide your own risk tolerance for yourself. For those of you working from home, you might wish to set up a separate network for your business activities as well as use VPN or a virtual private network technology. Some companies have equipment that provides VPN technology for their employees. Essentially, once the VPN connection is launched, it creates a secure tunnel between your computer and your office so that you can interact with company information securely. It'll specifically direct the traffic to to the company system that is required to connect to that to those company resources. Other VPN technology provided by third parties is secure insofar as you trust the VPN provider. I haven't really touched on publicly available Wi-Fi yet, but I'll tell you what I tell my husband. If I didn't set it up myself or if my workplace didn't set it up, I don't connect to it and neither should you. When you connect to a wireless network, you're basically saying that you trust everyone else who's connected to that network. I know this makes life awfully inconvenient. I travel with a MiFi device and I use that when I need internet access instead of connecting to any public Wi-Fi. Either hardware or software firewalls and antivirus products should be implemented too on all devices used to store confidential information. In some cases, these features are available on wireless routers. These days, also, Microsoft Windows comes with a software firewall. So I've alluded to this in earlier slides, but people using weak passwords or using the same password for different things is a common weakness that's exploited by hackers. Passwords should be at least 12 characters or better yet, 25. If you're notified that a password has been compromised, change it immediately. Ensure that each entity to which you log in has a different password. Some of you may wonder why you need to have different passwords for everything. Let's just say you have a Yahoo account and it's compromised. You know, some people would probably say, well, I don't really use it for anything important, so it's not like anybody's going to get anything important out of my Yahoo account. But if that password is the same password that you use for your bank, you could be in big trouble. Worse yet, if that account is the one that you used when you signed up for online banking, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and your healthcare provider's online system, an attacker could now use that access to that account to reset the passwords to those accounts and gain access to them too. If you're still not convinced, in the 2018 Black Hat Hacker Survey, they indicated that they exploit reused passwords more than any other method of gaining access to sensitive information. Now, back in the day, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, 
recommended that we create complex passwords by using a combination of uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. Well, it turns out that we're actually not that creative. And everybody was replacing L's with ones and O's with zeros. And ultimately, this ended up making passwords easier to crack. So recently, NIST started recommending that we actually keep passwords simple enough to remember, but lengthy, because it's really the length of the password that matters the most. Phrases work well, or combinations of random words that might mean nothing to somebody else, but are meaningful to you, like Banana Franklin 27 musical. Again, having passwords that are long is really the best thing. They also no longer recommend that passwords be changed frequently unless you learn that one may have been compromised. I would still recommend changing them at least every six months because often there are breaches that we don't find out about until you know months or years later. I know that many people asked about password managers. Because of the number of passwords we have to remember, I do recommend using a password manager. As with all products though, I believe that you get what you pay for, so I wouldn't necessarily use a free one. A related topic is multi-factor authentication. As noted in the Black Hat Hacker Survey, multi-factor authentication is actually one of the best ways to protect your accounts from being compromised. Multi-factor authentication means that you use a combination of something you know, like a password, <coughs> excuse me, with something that you have like a text message or a one-time passcode or something that you are like a fingerprint or facial recognition. If any of your accounts offer this service, turn it on immediately. It's the best way to combat a password breach. Even if somebody has your password, when they try to authenticate, they won't be able to unless they have your cell phone, passcode generator, or, well, I don't really wanna get into fingerprints. So most of the free email accounts like Gmail or Yahoo offer this, as does Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. For those of you using Microsoft products, Microsoft 365 and Azure both offer multi-factor authentication. I touched on this earlier when I mentioned email in the context of law firms and their ethical responsibilities. Think of an email like you do a postcard. When you send a postcard through, through the mail, others are probably not gonna look at it, but if they wanted to, they could. It's kind of the same with unencrypted email. Never send sensitive information in, in an unencrypted email ever. Additionally, if you're using free products for email or file sharing, you don't actually have any guarantee that your data is not being crawled for advertising or that it's even stored solely in this country. Business grade products usually allow you to specify the storage country and they have other privacy guarantees. If your lawyer or doctor or accountant has a specialized system for transferring information, make sure that you use those systems. If they're using free versions, then this is the time to question them about it and refuse to use those services. My accountant many years ago asked me if he could email me my tax return. I refused and made him put it in the mail. At the time, he told me that his other clients who were lawyers and doctors didn't seem to mind. I gave him a long lecture about this that resulted in him being an early adopter of an encrypted file sharing product. People think of these things as inconvenient, but if your lawyers and accountants are using these products, it's because they care about you and the security of your information. File sharing products should also always be set up such that a password is required to access the data rather than just clicking on a link. If the link falls into the wrong hands, <clears throat> excuse me, like if somebody gets into your email and sees an email that's got a link to get to some you know, sensitive information, they'll just be able to get directly to that information by clicking on that link. So if you're using a file sharing product, make sure that you always set it up so that the recipient has to enter a password before they can get to the data. So least privilege is a concept I discuss with law firms, but it's actually applicable to everyone. It's another name for what people are now calling zero trust. Law firms often set up their internal work product such that everyone in the firm can access it. This is so they can search their system to find, find out things like whether or not anyone in the firm has ever appeared before a particular judge or 
if they're looking for a particular precedent that's used in a certain situation. But depending on the sensitivity of the work product or the size of the firm, this might be accessible, or ex excuse me, acceptable. Like if it's a firm of only a couple of people, then yeah, they're gonna share the information. If it's a larger firm, then they might, then they might want to uh, set it up so that only the people who are required to see that information to represent the client can actually access it. This strategy can actually also be employed at home to ensure that kids that are on the same network as parents are either working from parents that are working from home or just handling their personal finances don't have access to the most sensitive information. The sensitive information should be protected so that it can only be, be accessed by those who need it. Setting up separate networks at home is one way to ensure this. Family members should never access home computer equipment using the same accounts as other family members for this same reason. Accounts should be set up so that only, the, only that person can access the data that's within his account. Even if malware gets onto a system, if separate accounts are used, then not all the data, data on the system will be compromised. So I just touched on this, but whether at home or at business, it's, best, it's a best practice and required for compliance with regulations that everybody have a unique user account. I've seen business situations where all employees who sit at, or at the reception desk will use like a reception account. Uh, if you're required to comply with HIPAA or, or any of these other regulations, this is a major no-no and it's just in general a bad security practice. It's not so much that IT people, IT people are trying to see who to blame for a breach, but if something happens, it's really vital to track down the source of a breach to know where it came from and it's also necessary when you're trying to eradicate it. Further to this, anyone who requires privileged access to systems should, not, should, should have more than one account. IT people are not immune from falling victim to hackers. In fact, since they're sometimes awakened to deal with tech emergencies in the middle of the night, basically nobody really does their best work when they're awakened out of a dead sleep. And I wouldn't wanna be put in a position where you know, my account has privileged access and maybe I'll click on the wrong thing because I was awakened in the middle of the night to deal with something. So it's best to have a secondary account that you can use when you need to have your privileges elevated to do something. Encryption is critical in keeping your data safe, especially when it comes to portable devices. Cell phones did not used to be encrypted by default with Apple devices, the act of adding a password to the, to the device would encrypt it. Older Android devices used to require going into the settings to encrypt the device. Newer Androids have encryption turned on by default. When it comes to laptops, Windows 10 has three versions, Home, Pro, and Enterprise. All three offer encryption options, but the Home version only offers hardware encryption and only if your hardware supports it. Certain Mac models come with encryption on by default, but for those that don't, File Vault can be used to encrypt data. Should these devices be lost or stolen, encryption will protect your data, provided your password is also strong enough. So another important point to mention, whether you're using business products or consumer grade products, please be sure to review the terms of service when you purchase new products or access new services. If the product or service will be storing your information, ensure that you retain ownership of your data. Also, it's important to find out if your data will be stored in this country. Even if your primary data is stored within this country, are the backups of that data, if they exist, also stored in the country? Review the onboarding and offboarding procedures as well and any requirements for any cloud product. Some vendors charge quite a bit to get your data back out of their systems should you decide to switch to a different product. This brings me to one of my favorite topics when working remotely, is the equipment that you use purchased by your company or by you? If you're a small business owner, you might consider the types of products you use. If you're having people use their personal equipment to access business systems, uh, or if you, then if you use pri primarily cloud products, do those products require that any data be downloaded in order to work with it? 
even if it doesn't, does it allow the export or download of any of the data? This is a risk in that businesses have no control over personal devices and how diligent people are with patching their systems or antivirus products, or even who has access to the machine. An alternative for those employees with personal systems is having them remotely connect to their PCs at the office or connect to a hosted desktop. Systems like these allow company data to stay on co company systems. Actually, the recent formal opinion about the virtual law firm covered this to an extent. It indicated that client-related information should never be accessible by family members and that devices should be encrypted and set up so, they, so that they can be remotely wiped. I haven't talked much about communications. Remote work actually brought greater challenges when it came to communicating with colleagues, subordinates, and clients, not to mention teachers and students. It was a challenging year that began with Zoom, WebEx, Teams, and GoToMeeting taking over the world. Always make sure that you add a password to your meetings where possible, or use your software security features to control who can access the online meeting. Having spent so many years working in the legal industry, my main concern was the use of personal devices for business communication and any discovery implications. Does your company have a mobile device policy? Are people issued company devices or do they connect using their personal devices for business purposes? If you're using a personal device for business, you might wanna check into the business's policy about what happens if you leave the company. Do they have the right to wipe your device? Do they have the ability to just wipe out the company information without affecting your personal information? And I know we're primarily talking about electronic data today, but you have to think about paper. Remember the uh, data that might get thrown in the dumpster without being shredded first. One of the firms that I worked for, Mitchell, Silverberg and Nupp, represented the Golden, Goldman family in the civil case against OJ Simpson. We actually put in a key card system at that time so that uh, anyone who worked for the firm could get to any of the floors in the building, but people who didn't work for the firm could only get to the floor that had the reception desk on it. At the time, our concern was that members of the press might get in and try to gain access to information. So we also had a war room where all the files for the case were kept and only a couple of people actually had the key to that room. Working remotely brought different challenges regarding paper. Those who had to process paper mail had to come up with plans to deal with it in a timely manner. I know some companies actually designated a few people to go into the office periodically and scan the paper mail and then distribute it to recipients electronically. For companies who received checks in the mail, they had to plan for someone to come in and process them. So I'd like to also reiterate the need to store paper containing sensitive information securely and shred it when it's no longer needed. Another topic related to this is what's called the clean desk policy. This was mentioned in that ABA formal opinion and they bring it up in relation to confidentiality of data. Whether you're at the office or working remotely, it's important to maintain, to ensure that client information is not visible to people outside the firm, or in the case of working from home, even family members. Speaking of paper, a lot of individuals and companies have retention policies that specifically deal with paper, but it's only more recently that people have started to put these policies in place for their electronic data. The more sensitive information you have, whether it's on paper or electronic, the more risk you assume. Sensitive information should never be retained longer than necessary. Many law firms already have paper retention policies in place. If you've ever worked with a law firm, they might have said something about that in their client engagement agreement or something like, you know, seven years after the close of your matter, they'll offer your information back to you or they'll shred it. Um, so a lot of firms put this in their engagement agreements and they'll just say they'll, they'll destroy your file. They don't specify electronic or paper and a lot of them are really reluctant to get rid of the electronic data. But if a breach occurred and it was after that seven years, they might end up having a breach notification requirement to notify all these people who thought that their data was destroyed. So back in the old days before email, every piece of correspondence at a law firm and, and any other business really was put into a file. 
Once email became ubiquitous, many were printing emails and putting them in the paper file. Companies began using document and email management systems that allowed them to keep electronic files instead of paper files. With that in mind, it's often a requirement that people migrate important client communication out of their mailbox and into these other systems. It's sometimes difficult for people to comply with these policies, but I have an example from my law firm days about why that's critical. If somebody leaves the firm, what happens to his or her mailbox? Even if it's monitored for a period of time before it's deleted, it's unusual for a lawyer or a paralegal to have time to sort through and ensure nothing related to the representation of those clients has been moved out of that email box. Worse yet, if the person who left was not organized and just had an inbox with 350,000 items in it, the situation's exponentially worse. I provide these examples just so that you can ensure that your lawyers and accountants are on top of these important risk management practices. But you can also keep these things in mind with your personal information too. Are you diligent about getting rid of old information once it's no longer needed? Having been the executor of several estates in recent years, from personal experience, I know that people are keeping far too much old financial information, both on paper and electronically. Hackers can learn a lot from your social media accounts. The first thing you should do if you haven't done so already is to check the privacy and security settings of your accounts and ensure that the information that you share is only being shared with the people to whom you're connected. This is where you can turn off personalized ads and location information as well. If you're a business owner and have an account for your business, that's, that's obviously different. But your personal social media accounts, uh, you should be vigilant about those. Even if you're only sharing information with people you know, if you connect to a company or a celebrity or a business, keep in mind that because their information is public, Anything you share on their site, so if you comment on something that they post, or if you like something that they post, that information that you just posted is now public based on the fact that you posted it on one of their posts. So that can then be aggregated by a hacker and used for a spear phishing attempt. So there's also the danger of oversharing. Think about what you post before you post it. Everything can be used to gain your trust or deceive your family members, friends, or coworkers. Even those games that are shared between friends where they ask you to list things like, what was your first car? What's your favorite food? All of these things are sometimes the secret questions used when you forget your password. But even if they're not, there's still more information about you that if a hacker got a hold of it, they could then see, they could then use that to befriend one of your family members or one of your friends and make them believe you know, that, they're, that they're you. If you click on anything that requires that you pass through your account information to take a quiz or play a game, that's one more entity with whom you're sharing your personal information. Don't include your birth date, email address, or phone number anywhere on social media where it's visible to people and absolutely do not accept friend requests or connection requests from people that you don't know. Keep in mind that whenever you share anything that comes from an unknown source, even if your best friend posted it, it might have originated from a nefarious source who's trying to manipulate you. I want to divert for a second to discuss cognitive bias. A great example of this is when a realtor stages a home to be sold. If any of you have sold a home recently, you know that realtors often ask you to remove most of your personal items, like family photos. The idea is to make the space nice, but neutral, so that prospective buyers can imagine their own things in the space. Anyway, if you look at these two photos, they're of the exact same room, but which house do you want to buy? The one on the right looks a lot nicer. So when bad actors try to propagate information on social media, they rely on your cognitive biases. They'll create memes with provocative photos juxtaposed, juxtaposed with some text that together play on your emotions. By sharing these memes, you're helping to sway others or even spread misinformation. Two types of cognitive bias are the halo effect and the horn effect. The halo effect is when one piece of information overshadows everything else. Like, there are many gluten-free foods these days, which is a selling point, yet only a small percentage of people have an intolerance to gluten. 
Also, some things labeled as gluten-free never had gluten in them to begin with. I've even seen water that had a gluten-free label on it. The horn effect is the opposite, making a snap judgment based on a negative trait. So for example, for those of you who remember the Ford Pinto, there were several incidents where due to a fuel system design problem, rear end collisions caused car fires. There were subsequent, subsequent lawsuits and negative media attention, even movie portrayals of Pintos being tapped lightly from behind and exploding. That ruined the reputation of the car, despite the fact that its safety record was actually comparable to other similar cars of its time. As you browse social media, keep these types of cognitive biases in mind. Don't take anything as fact. If you're considering reposting something, consider the source before doing so. Bad actors create these things and post them from made up accounts that were created solely for the purpose of promoting misinformation or disinformation. So I think I've run way over time, so I apologize, but I have some tips here that I'm not gonna read because I believe we're gonna be providing these as a handout to everybody. This summarizes some of the things that I've talked about. And then I have another list of resources. The SANS newsletter, I actually urge all of you to sign up to receive it. It's written in plain English so that anybody can, uh, can understand it. And they do things like they'll talk about social media or cell phones or all different types of security topics that are great for the consumer. Uh, and I think this page we're gonna be providing to everybody as well. And I see Suzanne back, back on video, so. Yes, um, thank you so much. That was so interesting and informative, um, a little bit frightening. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we are running late. So I'm just gonna ask a couple questions that have popped up. Um, and then we're gonna be handing out when we send out the survey, there is a link to uh, Rebecca's LinkedIn where you could uh, reach out to her and ask more questions. And then also the tips and the links that she just posted are also gonna be posted in the chat and then they will also be in the survey. So watch for those that should come out and then uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, there's been a lot of questions about password managers. Um, is there one that you recommend in particular? And are those password manager applications or whatever, are they vulnerable to hackers? Um. Well, ultimately, and I know nobody wants to hear this, but ultimately everything is, is your everything provide has vulnerabilities. Um, the main thing is whatever you use, two factor authentication, multi factor authentication is the best thing to protect you. If you're using a password manager, personally, I would never trust all of my passwords to a free product. Um, so I, I think uh, LastPass and KeePass are two that, that people that I know use and trust. Um, and again, uh, you know, multi-factor authentication really to me is the most important thing. But, but yeah, also having passwords that are lengthy. But I do believe password managers are the best way because I mean, I don't, I don't think I can even count the number of passwords that I have to remember in order to just live my daily life just in one day how many passwords I use to access things so password managers are definitely a good idea so I'm going to just take this as the last question we have a, a lot of questions but um I think we're going to just maybe maybe put in the survey if you would like to hear more from Rebecca maybe we could do another session um in the future maybe this fall or something uh, so I could talk know. about this for hours more. <laughs> um, I thought one uh, question that was interesting is talking about Alexa in your home. Do you think that the security risks um, outweigh the benefits for Alexa? Uh, well, I've been given free Alexas and free Google Home products from vendors, and they're sitting in a box in the corner and I've never used them. So perhaps that answers the question. <laughs> Um, then I'm going to ask one last question. 
Um, is it okay to use your computer to store your password? So when you're using your own computer and it stores the password for you, is that um, okay? I mean, the person says there's always a chance someone could steal your laptop, but do you think that that's relatively safe? Um, so I, I'm, I'm assuming, so I, I think it depends on the situation. Um, browsers now offer to save your password within the browser and the information could be cached locally. Um, having worked in law firms, I can tell you that um, we ended up turning on the feature that doesn't allow people to save passwords within the interface. And the primary reason for that is in a business setting, if your user profile ends up having some sort of a problem or if your computer gets infected, the first thing that IT people are gonna do is blow away your user profile, which includes all those cached passwords in your system. So if you don't remember what those passwords are because they were just cached in the system, now you're gonna have to go through and reset all of those passwords and you know all of that. So, so we, we blocked the saving of those passwords just so people would be forced to recommend that or to remember them, but that was before the advent of password managers. Um, so, uh, I, I think, you know, the other thing is there's a lot of talk, especially at the national level about, um, privacy and some of the big providers like Google, for example. Um, one thing that I heard, I can't remember if it was in a security lecture, it might've been a presentation by somebody from the FBI, but what I heard was, so somebody asked the question at a presentation about, you know, who has the most lobbyists in Washington, D.C. And people were thinking, you know, okay, maybe the oil companies, maybe, you know, insurance companies, but no, it's actually tech companies. Google and Facebook and companies like that probably have more lobbyists in D.C. than anybody else. And I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, in the near future with regards to privacy and some of the antitrust things that are going on. Um, I think I've gotten way off the topic, but hopefully, hopefully I answered the question. <laughs> well, I think we're going to end there. And Rebecca, thank you so much. I'm glad we finally made this happen. Um, and, and thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, it was very valuable. And um, like I said to everyone, watch for that survey that will have more information from Rebecca and also a link to the recording if you wanted to pass this on to anyone else. Um, also, we just put a link in the chat. Uh, please visit our virtual connections uh, website where it will show all of the, our upcoming events from the Alumni Association. Rebecca, thank you. I hope everyone has a great evening. You're welcome.